When I first sat down to write this TED Talk, I thought that it would be a really good idea to kick it off by telling you a little bit about myself. However, I quickly realized that I am extremely boring. Basically, my main two characteristics are that I write and I cry. I cry a lot. Seriously, sometimes I'm afraid that my tear ducts are going to swell up and explode one of these days, but I'll deal with that when I get to it. At my baby shower, my mom received two loveys, which are these bear-like stuffed animals with blankets for bodies. I've had them my entire life, and to be honest, their PTSD might be worse than mine. Seriously, the amount of snot and tears that they've absorbed over the last six, 17 years is just incredible, and I don't know how they're still intact. In kindergarten, the first two vocabulary words I ever learned were melancholy and resilient. My amazing teacher defined these words by writing them in a sentence on the board. He said, if you are melancholy, it is important to be resilient so that you can be happy again. Now remember this, I'll come back to it later. Mental illness is kind of my thing. I know way more about basically every mental illness known to man than most 17-year-olds, and I'm never afraid to open my mouth and go on and on about them. I have very strong opinions regarding mental health, and I'm never afraid to speak my mind. I've struggled with depression, eating disorders, anxiety, PTSD, and so much more since before I can remember. These other things included suicidal ideation and self-harm tendencies. The chemical imbalances in my brain stem from a wide variety of, of thorns life has stabbed me with, starting with being bullied throughout elementary and middle school. They called me Hannah Hippo, but to be honest, it made sense. <laughs> I started self-harming right before fourth grade, which was the same summer my parents sat me down on our old green couch in the den and told me that my dad had been diagnosed with anal cancer. And to be honest, it was kind of hard not to laugh, but that sounds terrible, but I was nine and it's butt cancer. Pretty soon, though, I realized that butt cancer sucks. My dad literally couldn't sit down anywhere. He had to stand all of the time. About a year after his diagnosis, my dad had to have a major, super scary surgery called a colostomy. It was scheduled for June 10th, 2011, at 7 in the morning. And I remember my parents were scheduled to leave for the hospital at 4 a.m. Therefore, I decided to wake up early to see them off. While my mom was getting ready, my dad asked me to sit down on their bed with him and asked me to do something really weird. He asked me to pray with him. The dictionary defines God as the creator and ruler of the universe and source of all moral authority, the supreme being. Now, until that morning, I had never put much thought into what I believed because there was never a need to. I grew up in a home with a, Demo a democratic Jewish mother and a Christian Republican father. So political views, as well as religion, was never shoved down my siblings in my throats. Instead, we were just taught to be ourselves and believe in whatever feels right to us after absorbing all the information on a topic. I don't know if any of you have ever prayed before, or if any of you remember your first time praying, but it is very uncomfortable. It's basically just a lot of sitting there awkwardly with one eye closed and the other squinted open slightly to make sure you don't look too dumb and you're doing it right. My dad started speaking aloud, and basically he asked God to help him survive the surgery and make him cancer-free. He, then he asked if I wanted to say anything, and I paused for a second before responding. It all felt so foreign and unnatural to me. And then I whispered in a soft library voice, please don't let my daddy die. At the end of the day, the surgery went perfectly, which caused me to wonder whether or not that could have been God's doing. My father had a number of surgeries in the year that followed his colostomy, and after the second one, he developed blood clots in both of his legs. Now, they became extremely swollen and felt like memory foam on a tempur mattress when you pressed down on them. Remember how I said he couldn't sit down at all? Now he couldn't stand either due to the extremely painful buildup of fluid in both of his legs. Imagine that. Imagine living in constant discomfort. Imagine not being able to sit. Imagine not being able to stand. Imagine not being able to walk, jog, bend over, get in and out of bed without help, or go for car rides that last longer than seven minutes at a time. 
imagine what it must have been like to be Dean Mercer. I watched him go through it and can't even imagine what it's like myself. I do, however, know what it's like to be a nurse at nine years old. This is my family. We seem pretty happy and normal, right? Well, behind the scenes, everything was falling apart and we were all struggling. I think one of the hardest parts of having a parent with cancer is having no one to talk to about it. I started therapy in third grade, but talking to a therapist is much different than talking to someone who truly understands and can relate to what you're going through. As I mentioned earlier, I quickly turned to self-harm in attempts to deal with my depression and anxiety. Reminder, I was nine. Not everybody has a soft place to land, which I learned from a very early age. I never had any friends due to being bullied, and unlike my siblings, who had plans and extracurriculars every day, and my mom, who worked full time, I went straight home after school. This meant I was left to take care of my dad Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. Because he literally couldn't do anything for himself, I positioned his pillows for him, helped him into bed, got him food, Diet Coke cans, insulin pens, did I mention anything else? and so much more. My main responsibility, however, was wrapping his legs in ace bandages. I had to do this so much, I still remember exactly how to do it. Seven bandages on his right leg and nine on his left. I had to do it every hour, so you can imagine the killer arm workout I got doing it, but it still sucked. So as you can tell, having a parent with cancer isn't very fun, and there are a lot of negatives and terrible things that come along with it. Work that in the end, was all for nothing. On Friday, August 10th, 2012, my father's doctor told us that his cancer was too aggressive and there was nothing more they could do for him. Words are my life, but I truly cannot find any to describe how it felt to hear that my dad was going to die in four to six months. On September 9th, 2012, my father died. It was a Sunday morning. Please note that this was only three weeks after, my, after his doctors told us that he had four to six months left. Looking back, it all seems so simple, though. Death is not as complex as we as humans make it out to be. Instead, all cancer had to do was change one letter, and Dean became dead. We held a memorial for my father two weeks after he died. Over 100 people showed up which we were not prepared for, and we did not have enough food for everyone. So I didn't even get to eat anything, which I'm still bitter about to this day. But maybe I'll get over it at some point. After the service, I experienced my first PTSD episode, my first flashback. Flashbacks are scary. They're often just like how they are in movies, black and white. And I see reality and the flashback layer at the same time. It's two layers, like the gum. My mind is like a honeypot, and my thoughts are bees in August, swarming around and buzzing loudly. My flashbacks totally take over all parts of me, and they consume my being. I was 11 when I experienced my first one, and I was sitting in the back seat of my mom's car. Suddenly, I was sitting on my living room couch, in my living room. I turned my head to the right to find my dad sitting there, with a Diet Coke in his hand, laughing. Now flashbacks aren't always just memories. They are also separate aspects of your life that come together to form one new memory. This is what my first flashback was like. I remember in that moment realizing two critical things in my grieving process. The first was that I would have given anything to have my father back. And the second was that life with my father would never exist again. And then it dawned on me. I wanted my father back, but where did I want my father to come back from? Where did he go when he died? Suddenly, I was hit with torrents of questions, questions that would consume my entire being as I searched for their answers. Questions like, where is my dad now? Is he really watching over me, etc. But one general question rose above them all. Is God real? I never anticipated how difficult it would be to find God in a seemingly godless life and world. How could God be real when science disproves 99% of what God is said to have done? 
it just doesn't make sense to me. And no matter how desperately I wanted to believe in something, I just couldn't and I can't force myself to believe in something that doesn't make sense to me. It wasn't fair to do to myself. However, then I realized, without God or religion, how can we connect with the deceased? I pondered this for years, raking all of the possible answers over in my mind. I thought maybe I could write letters to him, but writing letters felt awkward because I would never get a response in return. And speaking aloud to him felt uncomfortable because I was so uncomfortable when I was younger praying and I hadn't done it since. It just felt, again, so foreign and unnatural. And then, once again, I thought of another question. I should just stop thinking, honestly. It just leads to bad things. And then I asked myself another question. Does not believing in God mean when you die, you're just dead? Does it mean that darkness follows life? It broke my heart to think that the man who raised me was literally gone forever. That, he was, that his voice that boomed once so loudly could be silenced by death. After someone you love dies, your perspective of time totally changes. Instead of thinking in a normal way, you begin to think of it as a timeline going up to the moment your loved one passed away. Instead of thinking, in five years I'll be 22, I think it's been five years since my dad died. Does that make sense? It doesn't make sense to me, so if you know that, if it makes sense to you, please let me know, because I, I have no idea. Five years, six months, and nine days is a very long time to go without someone you love. In total, it has been 2,016 days since I lost my father, and as that number grows, so does the feeling of confusion as to how long he was actually here for. And however, came a realization. The best way to connect with someone who has died is by keeping them alive. My parents were always extremely fond of videotaping, and when I say extremely fond of, I really do mean extremely fond of. We have stacks on stacks of home movies. And I used to not like to watch them because it would hurt so badly, but I now consider them to be some of my family's most valuable possessions and some of the key parts in my grieving process. Eventually, over time, it clicked in my mind that with visual proof of my dad's existence, I could maybe, possibly, convince my subconscious that my dad was alive and present for the first decade or so of my life. And there were good times before and even after he was diagnosed. Photographic and cinematic evidence lives on of my father, even if my once complete family does not. My mother once told me that, when we, that we do not die when we take our last breath. Instead, nobody is really dead until the last time someone says their name. So talk about them. Tell their story. Reminisce and say their name. My search for answers regarding God, religion, and an afterlife ultimately taught me how to cope with the loss of my father and successfully battle my mental illnesses. So much so, in fact, that in seven days, I will be four years clean of self-harm. So, as you can probably tell by now, I'm mentally 35 years old. Therefore, it's kind of hard for me to make friends. Nobody wants to be friends with a girl who has 12 panic attacks a week and is constantly correcting their grammar. That said, I do have a few friends. I mean, not very many, considering my best friend's my sister, but still, I have a few. And a few months ago, we went to a party. I did not have fun at this party. While everyone else was smoking and drinking, I sat in the corner drinking a water bottle that I brought home. And my friends wanted me to join, but I was driving home in a few hours, and I don't know if they thought that that was okay, but I knew that it wasn't. And they called me a mom for this. Now, for the few months that followed that party, they continued calling me a mom. And I found it very offensive at first because I'm 17 and I don't want to be a mom. But then I realized that it was all because I grew up so fast. It's not an insult to be called a mom. Growing up quickly was both a blessing and a curse. The curse being I don't get to have as much fun as everybody else. But the hidden blessing in that 
is that I have the ability to think for myself, make good rational decisions, and I know that in 10 years, I'm not gonna look back and regret my high school years. Oh, I do sound like a mom, don't I? <laughs> now allow me to backtrack to when I told you earlier about my two vocabulary words that I first learned. Well, I've kept them in my mind my entire life. It is okay to have depression and anxiety and PTSD and any or all other mental illnesses because it's just something that a lot of us deal with. It's a part of our daily lives. However, no matter how awful they are and no matter how deep in an ocean of melancholy you find yourself, you must be resilient and you must bounce back. Thank you.